Praise the name of Jesus. Why don't you put your hands together for Jesus? He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Daddy Gio. We are really humbled and honored to be here today. And thank you, sir, for giving us an opportunity as the battle axe to be able to stand here and to minister. We have felt your presence. We have felt your support. And sir, we love you and appreciate you. God richly bless you. Let's put hands together for our daddy, our Gio. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. God bless you. May the Lord satisfy you early. May God bless you with grace and mercy. May you laugh all the days of your life. In Jesus' name, amen. We cannot forget our first lady, Mama Nelly. God bless you so much for standing with the man of God. God bless you so much. Amen, amen, amen. How about our DGO, the man of the spirit? Oh, man of his presence. Sir, God bless you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, Pastor Ken, we love you. We appreciate you. Amen, amen, amen. Before we get to the word of God, I want to just give my wife to greet us and to just say one word because of our time and then we shall go to the word of God. Amen. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Amen. I am the lighter version of Mr. Unchuru. So in case you don't see him, you can see me. <laughs> the Lord is good. Amen. We are honored and indeed uh, it's a privilege to serve the Lord this morning. And I'm glad that I can say like Joshua, as for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. So we are truly grateful, mom and dad, for give us, giving us an opportunity to serve in the Lord. And I pray that the Lord shall give us the grace and the ability to serve all the days of our lives. May the Lord bless you. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Let's appreciate her, please. Thank you so much. Amen. Yeah. Her name is Jacqueline uh, Onchuru Wavinya. Wavinya. That word Wavinya in Greek, those who, those, those who do, it means strength. Hey, strength. So if you scan that word uh, Wavinya in Greek means strength. And I thank God because of her life, she's been a strength and a pillar in my life, in our family. Amen, amen. Uh, allow me just to appreciate our deacon, deacon Maswili. I don't know if he's here today and his family. He has been so instrumental in the formation of the Battle Axe Fellowship. Uh, we will be able to appreciate him some more in the second service. But I want us to just put our hands together and just appreciate this man of God. Amen. Amen. He, he was the one who brought us to the east, eastern side of the Jordan. Praise the Lord. And he told us, now I want you to go and possess. Go to the other side. Praise the Lord. And I thank God so much because the Gadites and the Rubenites and the Manassites, the ones who went the other side from our clique, none of them is married. None of them has children. So Bishop, we have a powerful team that went to the western side of the Jordan. A powerful team. They have no baggages. Praise the Lord. <laughs> they have no kids. They have no husbands or wives. They are ready to face the enemy. If it is dying in the battlefield, they will turn the battlefield. But they are ready to go all full throttle. <laughs> Praise the name of Jesus. Amen, amen. Because of our time, I want us to read the Bible this morning and read uh, the book of uh, Jeremiah chapter 51 and verse 20. That being our theme verse today. Jeremiah chapter 51 and verse number 20. Jeremiah 51 and verse number 20. That is our theme verse for today. And I pray that God will give us grace to be able to share the word of God. Amen. Some of us, you know, we, we, we preach like sisters when they go for shopping. <laughs> Praise the Lord. You know, it takes me four to five hours when I go up country in my village, when I go. But coming back, especially when I'm driving with my wife, it takes me double the time. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Because at some point, we need to stop and buy some sugar cane. <laughs> then we drive for another 20 kilometers and stop and buy some, uh, some bananas. And then we drive for another 100 kilometers and stop and buy some cabbages, you know. Then stop again and buy some tomatoes. We get to Sokomjinga. Why is it called Sokomjinga? You get to Sokomjinga there and you stop and buy some onions. 
and then finally get to Kabeto there and buy, buy some, you know, something. So by the end of the day, you have spent almost eight hours on the road. So may, pray for me that I may not spend eight hours today. I'll go straight to the word of God. Amen. <laughs> Uh, Jeremiah chapter 51 and verse number 20. The Bible says, You, Cyrus of Persia, soon to conquer Babylon. I'm reading from the Amplified Version. He says, You, Cyrus of Persia, soon to conquer Babylon, are my battle axe or mole. And weapon of war. For with you I will break nations in pieces. With you I will destroy kingdoms. Again. You Cyrus of Persia. Soon to conquer Babylon. And my battle axe or mole and weapon of war. For with you I will break nations in pieces. And with you I will be able to destroy kingdoms. Let us pray. Father we thank you. This morning for the privilege of speaking your word. I pray, Spirit of God, may you anoint my lips this morning. Help me to declare your word, Heavenly Father. Help me to be able to speak it clearly, Heavenly Father. Let the church be edified. Let the enemy be terrified. And let God be glorified. We want to thank you and want to bless you. We pray this, believing and trusting in Jesus' mighty name. Somebody say amen. amen. Somebody shout amen. You are my battle axe. The book of Jeremiah is the longest book in the Bible after Psalms. It has 52 chapters. It was written by a man called Jeremiah. And they consider Jeremiah as a weeping prophet. And I believe it's because of what was happening in the days of Jeremiah. Jeremiah was in a day where there had been judgment declared from God upon, the, upon Judah. And so Jeremiah was present to be able to see the judgment of God upon Judah. The things that he went through as an individual. At some point he felt forsaken by God. At some point he would feel the pain of God destroying his people. And he would feel the pain of the people being destroyed by God. In fact, the Bible says at some point that he was saying that I wish my tears were like a fountain that would continually flow because of what was happening in Judah at that particular time. He was present when, when Judah was actually taken captive into Babylon. And so Jeremiah cried and he wept and he wailed because of what was taking place in Judah and what was taking place in the lives of God's people. But one of the things that was so fascinating to me about the book of Jeremiah is at the beginning of the book of Jeremiah, all the way to chapter number 50, God uses Babylon. God uses an instrument called Babylon to bring judgment upon Judah. But once you get to chapter 51, 52, now God uses another instrument to destroy Babylon. The instrument that God used to destroy Babylon. God raised another instrument to, de to destroy Babylon. It's interesting. Don't think that because God used you to inflict vengeance on somebody else, you are spared. God did not spare Babylon. And it is at this point where God raised up a man. A man called Cyrus, the king of Persia. And God makes an announcement. Jeremiah 51 verse Verse 20, please. It's basically an announcement from heaven. God is making an announcement and he's saying, you Cyrus, the king of Persia, are my battle axe. You Cyrus, the king of Persia, are my weapons of war. You Cyrus, by the way, Cyrus was not even a Jew. Cyrus was not even a so to speak, a Christian. Cyrus was a heathen king. Cyrus was a pagan king. Cyrus was an un-Jew. And yet God raised up an un-Jew, a non-Christian, a pagan, to be able to fulfill his purpose. That's why I have a challenge and a slight issue with men who tell me that they have a problem when God uses non-believers. Or they don't believe that God can use non-believers. 
Bishop, I was shocked because I read in, uh, in Jeremiah 29 somewhere, when, when God refers to Nebuchadnezzar as his servant, his servant. The man that God used to destroy Judah, God refers him as his servant. In other words, God can use anybody as long as his purposes are fulfilled. Praise God. God can use anybody. He is not a respecter of persons. His purposes must be fulfilled. His agenda must be addressed. At the end of the day, God's will must prevail. Somebody say amen. I was surprised when I read about Kathleen Kuhlman. You know, she was saying that God spoke to her. And she was saying that the work that she was doing was supposed to be done by a man. But the man refused to pick up that work. And so Catherine Kuhlman was given that responsibility. Because a man refused to man up and pick up that responsibility. Ladies and gentlemen, if we don't rise up and do what we're supposed to do, we can be easily replaced. Because the purposes of God must be fulfilled. His agenda must come to pass. Somebody say amen. If God could use a heathen king, if God could use a pagan king to be able to restore justice in Jerusalem, this is the same guy the Bible refers to in Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 1. Bible says in this first year when King Cyrus began to rule, God stirred up his heart. This is the God, this is the king that God stirred up his heart. And the Bible says, Ezra chapter 1, verse 1, it says, But God stirred up the heart of King Cyrus. But Cyrus made a decree. And he said, anyone of you who is here, who's been captive, I decree now you can go back to Jerusalem. You can go back to your land. And the Bible says, he didn't just send them back to the land. The scripture says that even him, Cyrus, contributed towards the building of the house of God in Jerusalem. A heathen king, a pagan king, an unbeliever. Praise the name of Jesus. And so we want to pray today. The same God, the same God who stirred up the hearts of Cyrus, a heathen king. May that same God stir up the kings of this land. May that God stir up the hearts of the rulers of this land. Uh, the lawmakers of this country. May the Lord stir up their hearts in Jesus' name. So that they can be able to agree with the justice of God. In Jesus' mighty name. Somebody say amen. Somebody shout amen. We are praying, may God move their hearts. If their hearts cannot be moved, then let them move out of the way. Hallelujah. Praise God. Let God move their hearts. If that, they cannot be able to, let God move them out of the way. God is able. If he did it in the days of Cyrus, he can do it in our days today. Somebody say amen. Shout amen. Shout hallelujah. When I read Jeremiah chapter 51 verse 20, the first thing that came in my mind is that there is war. Battle axe. War. When I saw battle axe, I saw war. Beloved, we are in a war. Whether you like it or not, whether you are aware or not, or interested or not, we are in a war. If we don't prepare ourselves well, then the enemy will take advantage of us. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, we are not ignorant of the devices of the enemy, lest the enemy takes advantage. So we must not be ignorant. Scripture says, Hosea chapter 4, verse 6, that my people die, my people perish due to what? What? Lack of knowledge. We are in a war. But ladies and gentlemen, our war is not against my brother and my sister. Hallelujah. We're not fighting against sisters and brothers, churches or families or nations. No, our war is spiritual. It is spiritual war. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12. Paul says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. We are at war. 
But the war is not physical, flesh and blood. No, no. It's not against your brother or sister. It is a spiritual war. When I read this verse, Ephesians 6.20, I looked up that word, wrestle or struggle in the Greek. I'm told you must quote Greek for you to finish a sermon. So I'm trying. And Hebrew. <laughs> that word wrestle or that word struggle in the Greek it means pali, P-A-L-I, P-A-L-I. Now this word pali was one of the most famous words in the Greek world. It was related to a particular kind of sport. Now, this was not just any other sport. First of all, that word wrestle was very common. Or that word pali. So when you say pali, everybody knew. It's like saying, yeah, let's go and play soccer. Let's go and play football. It's a common word. So in those days, the word wrestle or the word pali was very common. So when Paul is saying pali, these guys began to adjust their minds to understand what is Paul exactly saying. Now that sport called pali was a very, very ferocious sport. It was a wrestling sport. It was a fighting match. But you only emerge a winner once you've mutilated your opponent and you've killed them. Then you become a winner. Then you graduate to the next stage. So you only are successful once you have mutilated and you have killed your opponent. Then you have actually won the first stage. It was in three stages. It was bloody. It was, it was bad. So Paul is saying, we wrestle, we parley. Not against flesh and blood. In other words, it is ferocious. But not the one that you guys know. Because you guys know what happens in these sports. It is not that kind of, it is that kind of intensity. That kind of aggressiveness. But now it is not among people. No. It is among powers. Among principalities. Among rulers, among wickedness in high places, it is ferocious, it is bloody, it is bad. Paul is saying this is the kind of war we are engaged in. So we need to get prepared. But I have some good news for somebody today here. We are fighting, but guess what? We are fighting not for victory. Amen. Hallelujah. We are not fighting for victory. We are fighting from victory. Somebody shout hallelujah. Not from a point of fighting to win. No. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 15. Jesus made a public spectacle of the devil at the cross of Calvary. We are not fighting for victory. We are fighting from a platform of victory. Somebody say amen. Somebody shout amen. That's why the Bible says in Romans chapter number 8 and verse 37, that in all these things, in all these things, in all the, we are more than conquerors through Christ who loved us. Somebody say amen. We are fighting from an advantage position. We are fighting from a place of victory. Somebody say amen. Somebody say amen. amen. Hallelujah. So what must I do? I must enforce. Somebody say it. John 10.10. 10. The enemy came to kill, to steal, and to destroy. Christ came to give life and life in abundance. And we have come to restore. Amen. Hallelujah. John 10.10 10, part B. Amen. G, the enemy came. to He came. And Christ also came. We also have, we have come. Hallelujah. Jesus came. The enemy came. We also have come to do what? To enforce what has been written in the law. That is our position. So as you begin to fight, don't fight like a loser. Fight from a point of victory. Somebody say amen. Amen. Somebody shout amen. As you realize the enemy takes advantage of ignorance. Once you don't know your position, once you don't know who you are and what provisions are there in the law, you, you stand to be defeated by the enemy. Look at a policeman, a po policewoman, for that matter. When they flag you down and they say, sir, 
We've noticed that you've been doing 150 kilometers per hour. And then they tell you, by the way, by law, highways, you're allowed to do only 110. So you have actually trespassed. The law says it is 110. You have been doing 150. So you need to pay the price. But let me ask you, if this police officer has no clue what the law says about over speeding, what happens? Cars will just be driving like crazy all over the place. Why? Lack of the knowledge of the law. The enemy has taken advantage because we have no knowledge of the law. So I pray that after today, when the enemy comes in with stress, tell him it is written in the word of God. When he comes in with hunger, it is written in the word of God. When it comes with persecution and calamity, I say, devil, it is written. You cannot trespass according to the law. The Lord that I serve owns cattle on a thousand of hills. And so in Jesus' name, I rebuke you. I rebuke you in Jesus' name. Do you know the law? That's what the enemy capitalizes on. Ignorance of what the law says, of what the Bible says, of what God said, because it is finished. It is done. Jesus finished it. Somebody say amen. amen. The second thing I saw sir, is when I saw war, I realized Bible says, he says that Cyrus, you are my weapon of war. You're seated next to a weapon. Not the devil's weapon, but God's weapon. You are seated next to a machine gun. Next to an AK-47. Next to a revolver. Hallelujah. Next to a tanker. That's what the Bible says. You are my weapon of war. To beat down nations and to beat down kingdoms. Ladies and gentlemen, when God was about to beat down nations and beat down kingdoms and to enforce his kingdom. He used men. God uses men and women. When I say men, it refers to men and women. You'll forgive me. <laughs> Amen. God uses men to enforce his justice upon the land. Praise the name of Jesus. When God was about to, wanted to show Ahab that his gods take leave. And his gods go for holiday. And his gods can be tired. He raised up a man called Elijah. A weapon called Elijah. That is a weapon God used to prove to the king that, you know what? Your gods could be asleep. Your gods could be on a vacation. But listen to me. The God that I serve, he never sleeps. He never slumbers. Praise the name of Jesus. When God was about to bring justice, when the Philistines came against the people of God and they brought this great man called Goliath, God used a weapon called David. That's what God used. He brought out this man called David and he brought down this man called Goliath with this weapon called David. Praise the name of Jesus. Jesus. When God wanted to bring the people out of Egypt, out of bondage, he raised up a man called Moses. And he, he proved to Pharaoh that, you know what, with all your magic, with all your other gods, there is only one true God. There's only one living God. God uses men. If God uses men, God can still use you. Because the last time I checked, you are a man. Hallelujah. We are in a war. Unless we are prepared, we'll be hit left, right, center, unawares. Sir, so, we are weapons. There's a war. We are weapons. But I realize, the Bible says, you are my weapon to address nations and kingdoms. Thank God for village problems. Thank God for family problems. But God is raising you beyond that. God is raising us beyond that. In fact, when I was praying, I felt God is saying that he's raising kingdom commandos in this place. God is raising territorial warriors in this place. God 
God is raising continental principalities in this place. I saw GCR in Asia. I saw GCR in Africa. I saw GCR in America. I saw GCR in Australia. Not to address small things, but to address continental matters in the spiritual dimension. If I'm talking to you, say hallelujah. Shout battle acts five times. One. One. Two. Three. Four. Five. Battle acts for Jesus in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. People of God, if God is going to use us as his battle acts, as his weapons of war, something must happen. Just like any axe has to go through a process. If God is to use us, if we are to become effective ministers in our generation, effective weapons in the hand of God, there's something that we must be able to go through. If you look at a battle axe, the, 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 the owner or the warrior or the, or the, or the, or the, or the, 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 the warrior has to subject the battle axe into the furnace of fire so that he can be able to beat it and purify it and to shape it in a way that is acceptable to him. When I see fire, I see cleansing. When I see fire, I see purification. When I see fire, I see refinement. When I see fire, I see passion. Beloved, it is very unlikely that God can use us effectively if we have not gone through the furnace of God. A level of purification, a level of being cleansed, a level of being refined by the fire of God. Number two, for a battle axe to be effective in the hands of a warrior, it has to be sharpened regularly. Otherwise, it become blunt. And where I come from, we use two things to sharpen axes. One, a stone. And two, another metal bar or a file. So use a stone or a metal bar. Now Jesus is our stone. Jesus is our rock. Unless we have close interactions with Jesus. Jesus, unless he closely interacts with us. We cannot be sharp. Bible says, iron sharpens iron. Unless I am close with my brother and my sister, I cannot be sharp. So for God to effectively use me, I need to, be, I need to allow myself to be sharpened by the word of God. For Christ is the word of God. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. And for me to be effectively used by God, I need to allow my brother and my sister to sharpen me, to encourage me. When I come for fellowship, Somebody testifies, I'm encouraged because of what they've gone through. I realize also I can also go through and come out successful. Somebody say amen. amen. Last but not least, for a battle axe to be effectively used in the hands of the warrior, it has to be regularly used. If you don't use things regularly, they, thank you, sir. They rot. There's rust. And the last time I checked, Rust, for me, it represents neglect. If you see some place that rusted, that means that place has been neglected. If you don't get used, if you don't allow yourself to be used regularly, you begin neglecting fellowship. You neglect prayer. Check it very well. People that neglect prayer, neglect fellowship, going to church, check. Rust has begun to and dust has begun to. Because the more God uses you, the more you become effective and useful in God's kingdom. Let's rise on our feet. Amen. In Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we thank you. We bless you, Heavenly Father. Hallelujah. We are the battle axe of God. We are the weapons in the hands of God. It is my desire, not only for the Battle Axe Fellowship. This word is, I think, for all of us. Yeah, it's for all of us. And it is our desire, it is my desire. If we are to go to places where God has spoken to us about, if we are to address nations, address kingdoms, 
then God must be able to use us. We must be available for the use of God. We must understand that we are in a war, beloved. We cannot sit and be ignorant of what the enemy is doing. Praise the name of Jesus. I want us to lift up our hands in just a minute as we just ask the Lord to just, that word to sink in our spirits and in our hearts. Just like God spoke to Cyrus, that he is his, but he is his weapon of war. I say, Lord, make me an instrument of your war. Make me an instrument of justice. Let me not be an instrument of the devil, a weapon of the devil. The devil's weapon is malice, is murmuring, is complaining, is lies, is temptation, is corruption. I don't want to be a weapon of the devil. I want to be God's weapon. I want to rise up against all these vices. Lord, raise me to be a battle axe. Raise me to address kings and nations in Jesus' name. I know by your grace it is possible. I know by your grace it can happen. Lift your voice and say, Lord, it is me. It is me, oh God. You are calling me to be a weapon of war. Help me not to be reluctant. Help me not to be passive. Let me be active. In Jesus' name, let me be active in this last season, in these last days, as you're calling us into, into national assignments, international assignments, as you're enlarging our territories. Oh God, may I be among the people that you can trust, that can depend upon as a weapon in your hands. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Just lift up those hands and let's worship the Lord Jesus Christ together. Let the Lord Jesus minister to you this morning.